Good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth, the Education Coordinator for Marlene's Market in Delhi. Tonight's special guest that we have with us, which is always a pleasure, uh, which is um, he is the Diplomat in Advanced Nutritional Laboratory Assessment um, and the Educator for Now Foods. He's also a board certified clinical nutritionist. Neil Levin. Thank you so much, Neil, for joining us. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. We'll get started here. These are some of my credentials. Just so you know, I have a, some clue what I'm talking about. I've been doing this a long time. This is actually my 30th year as a clinical nutritionist. So uh, interesting. So let's talk about vitamin D, or as we say in London, vitamin D. Uh, my first talk on vitamin D was 2011 in London at the CAM Expo. So this is a, obviously a fresher version. Uh, vitamin D is a unique nutrient because we can not only get it from the diet, but we can make it by internal synthesis. We can actually make it in our bodies. And the process, as you see on the bottom of this slide, uh, UVB rays from the sun convert cholesterol to pre-vitamin D which gets converted by the kidneys and the liver into by the forms that are used by the body. So vitamin D is available from certain foods. They are typically animal foods, mushrooms, and of course, fortified foods, you'll often see vitamin D added on the labels. But sunlight is uniquely a source of this vitamin. There are a few foods that contain vitamin D without being fortified, oily fish, and especially the, the fish livers. So smaller fish tend to have a lot of vitamin D as well as vitamin A. And wild caught salmon has a lot more than farm raised salmon, uh, probably about five times, four to five times as much vitamin D from the wild caught. Now making vitamin D in our skin, everyone's heard about it but you might not be aware of the limitations, what it takes to make it. Uh, first of all, high or low latitudes, are you farther from the equator or are you at a high altitude? Darker skin pigmentation, the winter months, and we're gonna talk a little more about that on another slide. Sun avoidance, including using clothes or sunblocks. Scar tissue can't make vitamin D. Aging skin has a difficult time. Clouds, pollution, haze tend to affect the UV ray, ray intensity coming to your skin, and it won't work through glass. If you ever notice, you know, you're in a car, you're not getting a sunburn on the arm in the window if the window is closed. So vitamin D deficiency can occur if you're not getting the recommended level over time. People more at risk are those who cover up when outdoors. Many of us do. Uh, people who use sunscreen is another type of cover-up. People who don't spend much time in the sun, nursing homes, institutions, homebound people. People with medical conditions, celiac and inflammatory bowel disease interfere with absorption of fats and fat-soluble nutrients. Uh, medical conditions as well. If you don't have a gallbladder, it's harder to absorb fats. People taking medications, especially certain anti-seizure medicines, People with darker pigmented skin. It takes a lot longer for the sunlight to penetrate a darker skin, which is actually a filter to prevent the sun from making too much vitamin D. People who are obese or very overweight tend to have increased need. And uh, there's other risk factors as well. Uh, so even if you're looking at Florida, the sunshine states, five other states get more sunlight than Florida. Florida has only 74 clear days a year in Miami, and it has more cloud blockage than any other state. Sorry, Washington. But Florida actually can be cloudier than you. And uh, I was just on the phone with our, uh, a doctor in Dubai this morning, and I'm doing a training for a hospital group there next Sunday. And... Uh, the Emirates there in the Middle East have one of the highest vitamin D deficiency levels on earth. 86% of residents are vitamin D deficient or don't have sufficient amounts. 
although there's plenty of sun there. People don't want to go out when it's 120 degrees and humid. So, and there's also cultural issues where people get covered up as well. Same thing with Spain. Uh, Middle-aged adults have only about two thirds of the vitamin D production potential of children. It gets harder as they get older. In the winter, it takes four times as much sunlight to get vitamin D as it does in the summer. And people are inside, they're wearing sunblock, protective clothing, hats. They're simply not going out and getting the sun in uh, places like that. People in Canada get more sunlight than people in Florida on the average. And they recommend in, in Florida, farther south, of course, and we're going to address that issue in a minute, uh, 10 to 15 minutes of sunshine three times a week and hit the skin on the face, the arms, the back or the legs without sunscreen. You need to have a substantial amount of skin facing the sun. Now, here's how you can make vitamin D from sunlight. Look at this chart. Uh, you're going to be in that second row of dots from the top. Uh, that's Chicago, that's Seattle, that's Tacoma. Uh, and if you notice the, the circles that are clear, January, February, November, December, you cannot make any vitamin D. You can go out in the sun, stark naked at high noon on New Year's Day, you cannot make vitamin D. There's not enough sun. Uh, the three darker colors in the middle, June, July, August, this is when you can make the most vitamin D. And the orange ones, the orange circles, March through May and September, October, you, you kind of can make vitamin D. I know in Chicago, it runs where we can make vitamin D from late March to late September. That's it. That's the only time you can make vitamin D during the year. And look at the shadow rule on the right. The shadow rule says if your shadow is longer than your height, you cannot make vitamin D. If you are five feet tall and your shadow is six feet long, you cannot make vitamin D at that time. The sun is too low in the sky. The UVB, the UVB rays are filtered out of the sunlight where you cannot make the vitamin D. And there's a key at the bottom. It shows intense sunshine, which in this area is going to be June through August, summer. 10 minutes if you're light skinned, 45 minutes if you're dark skinned. You need a substantial amount of skin facing the sun to do that. Uh, moderate sunshine, if you're talking about spring and fall, it takes uh, two to three times as long to make the vitamin D then. So, you know, that's important to know. You can only make vitamin D at certain times. And a lot of times you'll hear on TV news or something, someone saying, oh, you just go out in the sun and you make your vitamin D. Well, not if it's October, not if it's January. You're not going to do that even on a nice day. So uh, the shadow rule is something that I, I hope everyone will remember from this, if nothing else. So let's look at some of the expert opinions on how people can be deficient in vitamin D. First of all, Abbott Nutrition has five nutrition tips every man needs. I'm not showing you all five here. I'm showing you the one that says, check your vitamin D levels. And if you're at extreme latitudes or don't spend much time outside, have vitamin D rich foods, including fortified foods like milk, fatty fish, and egg yolks. And you need this to, for both muscle and bone health to keep you strong. And they also report that uh, over 40% of Americans are deficient in vitamin D. It may be higher in the elderly. And the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality says you should have your levels tested and find out if you need to take a vitamin D supplement. I take a vitamin D supplement because I know I need it, but my mother takes it because it's been prescribed by her physician. And Men's Health Magazine says special diets can lead to nutrient deficiencies. For example, a paleo diet, uh, you could be, have deficiencies of vitamin B2, riboflavin, calcium, and vitamin D. Those aren't the only ones, but they're the ones pointed out by this magazine. 
and you need them for the brain, the heart, for the mood, for dental health, for sleep. And have the doctor test your levels. You're looking for at least 30 nanograms per milliliter. There's actually two different scales used around the world. This is the one used in the, in the US. And take at least 1,400 units if results are lower. Now, you're probably not going to be able to find a supplement with 1,400 units, but it is safe to take up to 10,000 units per day. And vitamin D supplementation stabilized the PSA labels in men and helped them maintain a balance of prostaglandins. These are master compounds in the body that control inflammatory processes. So uh, prostate health, there are, the prostate has vitamin D receptors and uses vitamin D. So that's one reason why you use vitamin D. Another reason is it maintains calcium and phosphate homeostasis. That means appropriate amounts in balance. And bone mineralization, bones receive minerals. There's about 15 nutrients needed to build bone, but calcium and phosphorus are the two largest ones besides protein, collagen. But vitamin D also regulates cell growth, cell differentiation, and immune function. So that's extremely important. And we know that plasma levels of vitamin D are lower in vegetarians and vegans than people who eat meat and fish. So diet also determines your risk factor for whether you need to supplement with vitamin D. Now, when we look at the European version of the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, it's the European Food Safety Agency. And they've actually recognized benefits of vitamin D beyond bone and dental health. Those are the only accepted official reasons for vitamin D being an essential nutrient in the United States, bone and dental health. And the RDA and the daily value that you see on labels are based on bone and dental health only and not the additional benefits. And here's some of the other benefits recognized by the European Food Safety Agency, which is actually a very conservative government body. Muscle health, and remember the heart is a muscle, so that's included. Healthy immunity, balanced inflammatory response, reproductive health, and cellular health, the health of our cells. So their panel also said that people who are over 60 years old who consume over 800 units, which is 20 micrograms of vitamin D, either vitamin D2 or vitamin D3, have a significant reduction in the risk of falling. So think of older people who fall down and they might hurt themselves, they might end up in the hospital, they might end up in a nursing home because they fell down. They might actually lose their independent living status. If, if they have too bad of a fall. And there's something about the vitamin D that prevents them from falling. Significant reduction of risk of losing your balance and falling. That vitamin D and calcium together can benefit body sway, muscle function and strength and both to redu significantly reduce the risk of falling down. Bet you didn't know that. That's not, that's actually not well known. And uh, vitamin D and resistance exercise improves muscle strength. The combination works better than just resistance exercise. And that's a possible solution for the loss of muscle that's commonly associating, associated with aging. But immunity is a, something that's had a lot of interest. I've done lectures all over the world on vitamin D and immunity in the last couple of years. There are vitamin D receptors in the immune cells of humans. Vitamin D, uh, either colocalciferol, which is the animal-based form, including the form we make in our skin, or ergocalciferol, vitamin D2, which is the form you would get in mushrooms and many supplements. They both work the same way, and they work on various macrophages and immune cells, uh, interleukins and neutrophils and uh, you know, all these things that you probably don't want to hear all about all the details. But 
It is used in both innate and adaptive immune response. The difference is innate immune response is your immediate ability of certain immune cells to target and attack what they perceive as invasive organisms. And adaptive immunity usually takes two or three days to build up, and that's where they call for reinforcements. And they're not able to take care of whatever is there quickly. And the adaptive immune system actually has a lot more memory in terms of it, it will figure out what was there and how to deal with it. And it's more important for the immune system to remember things that take a lot of effort to fight than something that the innate immunity, the scout cells, in essence, who are armed, can simply take care of. They don't need to remember it. They simply get rid of it. So innate immunity gets rid of things. And if it doesn't work, they have to call in the reinforcements. That is the adaptive immunity. So vitamin D has a role in both systems. And in controlling the immune response where it's not over aggressive, where it's not causing too much inflammation, too much uh, congestion, you know, things like that. So vitamin D, serum vitamin D actually works as an immune system modulator, preventing the excessive expression of cytokines, which are inflammatory compounds. And it when, I, when we say enhancing the oxidative burst potential of macrophages, imagine white blood cells are actually like little tanks in our body with weapons. And you're actually giving them, you're upgrading their weaponry when they get vitamin D. The immune cells are more powerful, but it also prevents the destruction from spreading to other cells. It helps control that. So the neutrophils, the monocytes, the natural killer cells, and especially in the respiratory tract, they protect the lungs as well. So vitamin D receptors are on a, a bunch of immune cells, the monocytes, macrophages, T cells, B cells, other immune cells. And, the, and these, there's actually an enzyme in these cells that converts the intermediate form of vitamin D to its active form in the body. So the immune cells are actually part of what makes the vitamin D effective for doing other things, including working on the prostate gland and helping normal functions, including uh, bone health. Uh, it requires the immune cells as part of that conversion. And vitamin D also can convert monocytes to macrophages, which are destructive cells and it's regulated by vitamin D metabolites. So vitamin D helps the immune cells to form in response to a challenge and makes them more powerful at the same time. So it helps mature immune cells and, and the, the mature ones that that works on are, are much stronger than other immune cells. Blood sugar is another area where vitamin D has an important role. Vitamin D deficiency reduces insulin secretion. So that's important to note. Uh, the, the aisles of Langerhan in the pancreas that produce insulin are vitamin D dependent. So vitamin D stimulates insulin secretion. There's a receptor on the beta cells in the pancreas but it also reduces insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is where the blood sugar builds up in the bloodstream and, and isn't able to go into the cells where it belongs. And, and you end up with the blood sugar rising too high because it has nowhere to go. And so that's called insulin resistance. Uh, and that's a problem. You need insulin sensitivity. You need the insulin to work. So vitamin D is one of the factors. Alpha lipoic acid would be another, you, you, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, uh, that helps with healthy glucose metabolism, healthy insulin sensitivity, and helps the vitamin D receptors in places like the muscles, the liver, the immune cells, and the fat cells. So they're all dependent on insulin sensitivity moving blood sugar into those cells. In fact, it's well known that diabetics have very low vitamin C status in their immune cells, and their immune cells need about 200 times as much vitamin C 
as the circulating concentration in the bloodstream. You can see how that how important it is. <coughs> excuse me that the <coughs> that the uh, vitamin C gets into immune cells. <coughs> They're also finding that when they test adults with and without diabetes, there is a relationship between vitamin D status and blood sugar levels, both in diabetics and in people who are not diabetic. Vitamin D status tends to imply a more healthy, normal blood sugar. And this is from the U.S. National Institutes of Health. So this is not you know, something that's radical out there. This is mainstream science. And in fact, in surveys, national surveys in the United States, metabolic syndrome, which is a precursor of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as well as diabetes and heart disease, it's a, it's a cluster of symptoms uh, that is a precursor. It's not a disease. But the odds of having metabolic syndrome decrease as you increase your vitamin D. And the people who get the low, le least vitamin D but take some vitamin D, have about a 19% lower risk of metabolic syndrome, but the people who get the most vitamin D have a 38% risk factor for getting uh, metabolic syndrome. Uh, their odds drop about in half of getting met metabolic syndrome, which is a syndrome because of the cluster of symptoms that can predict these other problems. There are other health issues, a widespread pain in women. And, you know, women have many reasons for pain, including men, but this is a different one. Uh, they looked at uh, age 45, they looked at their serum vitamin D levels and their pain reporting, and there was significant widespread pain in women who were deficient in vitamin D. It caused pain, and it's, it's no wonder since it has a role in muscle health and, and things like that. Now, when we're looking at evolving recommendations for vitamin D levels, 34% in Canada had a vitamin D serum level within a year that qualified as insufficient levels. And you know, Canada is not too far from uh, Washington State there. And 10,000 units or 250 micrograms a day <clears throat> is the safe level in studies. The upper limit is 4,000 because of a wide margin of safety built into the 10,000, which is the safe level in medical studies. So if you see a 5,000 unit, which is what I take a day uh, as a product, uh, it's not unsafe because the 10,000 is the real safety limit. 4,000 is the official limit so that because they figure people are going to overdo it or take too much. Many people recommend, uh, this is the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, for example, 800 to 1,000 unit is the minimum for children and adults. It is not the recommendation. 600 is the daily value. And when you're looking at serum levels of 25 OHD, 30 to 50 on the American scale or 75 to 125 in the European Asian scale, uh, they're equivalent, uh, would be the amount that would be recommended. So uh, I try to keep my level above 50. Some people recommend uh, 40 to 60 as being optimal. 30 would be considered sufficient where you're not deficient. And if you're below 20, that, that is pretty deficient. So 40 to 60 is the appropriate target to prevent the major vitamin D deficiency related diseases. They're talking about cancer, heart disease, a lot of things like that, uh, which of course, you know, are not label claims, but the, you know, that's what the research shows. And taking a thousand units for every 25 pounds of body weight or a safe sun exposure, which some people think is, you know, a little tricky to get, uh, Sunlight is reputed to prevent half, twice as many cancers as, as it's considered to cause. But of course, certain types of cancer are more likely with sun exposure. 
certain ones are more likely to be reduced by the sun exposure and the vitamin D. So it depends on which cancers you're looking at, what the risk factors are. You know, certainly, uh, you know, the, the, this cancer of the skin would be the most concerning thing. But getting the, the children's serum levels between 40 and 80, they will get the optimal health benefits from that. Um, at about 88 nanogram per milliliter, the body starts downregulating vitamin D, the skin starts getting darker and tanning to prevent the sunlight from making it go higher than that. So somewhere around 88 is the maximum that will naturally occur in the body. Uh, levels about 200 cause kidney damage. So you could see you don't want to overdose on it, but of course the 10,000 has not been shown to do that. If you're dark skinned, if you're veiled or institutionalized, elderly, not out in the sun, all those other factors, 800 would be the minimum, even though the RDA and daily value are 600. People who are obese or have fat malabsorption, uh, say no gallbladder, might need higher doses. And when you're measuring vitamin D, vitamin D2 and vitamin D3 are equivalent. They're both absorbed equally according to the Institute of Medicine, the, the NIH. And in, this is a study by Michael Hollick, one of the world's leading researchers on vitamin D. And he published that, uh, he looked at his patient records for seven years. Patients got a thousand units a day of either vitamin D2 or vitamin D3. And they had the same serum vitamin D levels. It did not affect them. It did not affect the calcitriol and the hormones that are made from vitamin D. They were equivalent at these physiological doses. The difference between D2 and D3 occurs at the medical levels where they're giving you tens of thousands of units at a time. That's where there's a difference when you're getting the 50,000, 100,000 units at a time from a doctor there's a difference in how they work in the body in terms of survivability and toxicity, where D3, according to Cornell University, is 10 times as toxic as D3 at high doses because it persists in the body longer than D2. But at a low dose, like 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, there's really no difference between D2 and D3 in the human body. And even the National Institutes of Health report that in supplements and fortified foods, these two forms, vitamin D2, the, the vegetarian form, and D3, which is the animal-based form from cholesterol, differ chemically only in side chains. They both cure rickets, and most steps involved in their metabolism and actions are identical. So either one is going to work. Both forms raise the serum levels according to the NIH. And at nutritional doses, they're equivalent. At high doses, D2 is less potent because it disappears quicker and it's not as toxic at high doses. But we're talking about medical doses, heroic doses. Physiological doses are nutritional doses. And, and there's no real difference there. I'll point out one more thing. There was a study done in Finland where they took thousands of babies and they gave them vitamin D 2,000 units uh, when they were born. Uh, gave them 2,000 units a day for the first year of life, and it lowered the rate of type 1 diabetes by over 70%. They tracked them till they were adults. So a very large Finnish study uh, of, of infants and where they were routinely administered vitamin D and they tracked their rate of type one diabetes uh, and it was dramatically lower. And that, that points out the role between vitamin D and the pancreatic function. Now, because I'm talking about disease here, I'm not talking about specific products by my brand because I'm not gonna make claims based on uh, diseases and medical things, even though vitamin D has a role in that. Uh, I, I, can't, I'm not, I can't point out specific products and link them to those kind of claims because the, in the United States, there are laws preventing 
medical claims and disease claims for dietary supplements, even if they're true, even if they're basic biochemistry, even if they're basic biology, it's illegal to make those kind of claims related to product marketing and labeling. So that's why I'm not showing you any of our products because I'd rather you get the information you need and you know what company I work for you know, if, if you really want to uh, look, look at what's going on. But uh, that's you know an important factor that the, the, these nutrients have a role that we can't always tell you about because of these gag rules in law, which we follow. So uh, with that, that's the end of the presentation. I don't want to keep you on too long, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Way to unmute yourselves at this time. Use the features here in the Zoom. You, you're soft. Sorry. There you go. Oh, speaking too soft. Um, feel free to unmute yourselves. Use the features here on Zoom and um enter any questions in the chat box as well i'm gonna check facebook live here right. so yeah here's someone who said i never had a patient tested for vitamin d was not low normal or deficient and i used to test routinely they were all canadian so all the canadians they tested were were high you know in, in the study we saw it was over 46 percent, but you know Um, that study about um, giving the infants the vitamin D and how that dramatically affected, um, you know, them um, developing um, uh, developing any, um, you know, kind of uh, health concerns down the road was just really fascinating. Yeah, I know that's that's something I presented at an immune uh, lecture I did for a hospital in Dubai a couple of weeks ago, and they, they were all surprised by that. They they thought that was very interesting. You know, just giving a you know because two thousand is the upper limit for infants, four thousand is the upper limit for adults, uh, and actually after age two, it's it's the same uh, for adults and, and kids for vitamin. But. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, um, looks like we have a question. Um, feel free to. Um, You're to looking ask. for the. They're wondering how to access the the study from Finland. Oh, um, actually, I think we have. Um, uh, oh darn! Um, I forgot how to pronounce your name, hon. Oh, it's Teres. Teres, that's right. Teres, do you have a yeah. question? Yeah, I'm just curious. You, you talked about vitamin D3 and D2, but you didn't talk about, what, is there any recommendation as to types of way to get vitamin D? All the, all the ways are equivalent. I'm sorry for the noise, noise but are, are they all equivalent in your estimation in terms of source, food sources and that kind of stuff? Because I'm not, I get some sun, but I, I don't get enough sun. I really cannot rely on that. And I've heard varying degrees of reliability and how much vitamin D you get when you're out in the sun, as you were talking about, too. Right. So, I mean, it, as a baseline, we recommend people take, you know, somewhere between the, the 600 you'd probably get in a multivitamin and the 1,000 or 2,000 that, that would be common in a supplement form. The... Now, now beyond that, the, uh, I mean, vitamin D is in fortified foods. You can get it in orange juice. You can get it in milk. You're not getting a ton in those sources, but you are getting a significant amount. Yeah, I, I don't go for milk very much. <laughs> so yeah. I'm not a dairy product lady on the whole. Okay. But, uh, now the study from Finland, it was 10,000 children born in 1966. They were followed for 31 years. 
They got 2,000 units a day of vitamin D in the first year of life. And there was a lower risk, a 78% lower risk of developing type 1 diabetes compared to no supplementation or higher doses. This was in a journal called Autoimmunity Reviews in 2010, issue 9, page 709. So autoimmunity Auto reviews, uh, issue nine, year 2010, page 709 to 715, has the details that uh, it should be available on PubMed or whatever. 2,000 units for a baby, it seems a really high dose. It does, it, doesn't it? Yeah, it seems You're, like a really high dose. But and you know what? Um, my, my company actually partnered with Abbott Labs to where we supplied a liquid vitamin D drop. I lost my focus here, didn't I? Uh, a vitamin D drop for infants, for new mothers. So mothers would get these hack, the, these kits when they were leaving the hospital uh, after they got their babies, uh, after they gave birth, I should say. Uh, and in the kit was a dropper bottle of vitamin D that allowed them to, uh, supplement the baby with vitamin D. And that was considered important for infant health to supplement vitamin D to the infant. Let me, I never yeah, lost my of, focus. Uh, hmm. Well, I think you're really keeping on task though. <laughs> Get it, focus. Yeah. <laughs> That is strange. I've never been blurry before. Yeah. Let me switch. Well, there See we go. That helps. Yay, you're back. I just toggled the video setting there. Right. Gotta love technology, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is not a background. This is my actual office. Yeah, so. that's a sweet office. Oh, you should see yeah, the mess over there. Oh. All, the, all the boxes and things. <laughs> I'm I'm sure they're full of uh, really good literature and books. So no, the books are back here. Uh, that's uh, electronics and uh, stuff from. I, I have a bunch of genealogy stuff I got from family that I'm scanning. So oh, very cool. Yeah, that's that's the best doing doing those deep dives into uh, genealogy. Yep. So yeah, I mean, lots of interesting studies. I didn't go into a great depth. I mean, I could do uh, different health topics just on vitamin D, but you know, I mean, vitamin D is important, and you know, there there are some vegetarian vitamin D threes, but uh, some of the, you know, they're from lichen typically, and lichen are two organisms that make D two and D three. And some of the companies may be claiming D3 when it also contains natural D2 from the other. Uh, lichen is actually uh, like a fungus and another organism together. It's a symbiotic dual organism. So they're making two forms of vitamin D, not one. Fungus makes D2 typically. It can make a little D3, but that's rare. So um, our our bodies could potentially get the D2 form or the D3 form from those lichen-based vitamin Ds. It's probably both, even if they're only claiming one on the label. But it doesn't matter, they're both good. That's the thing. Yeah, that's, that's the beauty of it because our body still takes a lichen to the <laughs> D2. <laughs> nice. Are there any special requirements for absorbing vitamin D? You know, we can take vitamin D, but if we don't absorb it, are there any, is there any, any information about that? Well, definitely. Um, vitamin D is a fat soluble nutrient and it requires fat to be absorbed. Uh, for fat absorption, when you, when you eat something, you need to take it with a meal because you need a certain threshold of fat and a certain amount of protein, actually, to trigger your pancreatic enzymes and your bile. 
and it takes at least five grams of fat to help you absorb fat soluble nutrients about a teaspoon would be a minimum so there's never enough fat in a soft gel capsule to help you absorb the nutrients in there completely you know you might get a partial so you know having a teaspoon of fat is important but uh, to trigger pancreatic enzymes, there's a, another, another factor in there, of course. Um, now, if you don't have a gallbladder, that's actually a more important issue because the bile secreted by the gallbladder is kind of like a fishing net that comes into the digestive tract and pulls in the uh, fats to the liver and the fat-soluble nutrients. No gallbladder, you can't do that very efficiently. Uh, one workaround that I recommend is the MCT oil, the medium chain triglycerides, which absorb almost as rapidly and easily from the GI tract as alcohol, which actually absorbs very well. And so it's a nice carrier to help you absorb fat soluble nutrients. And I would suggest it may even be conditionally essential for people without gallbladders to take a small amount of MCT oil with their fat soluble nutrients, whether it's food or supplements to make sure that you will be able to absorb it well, since you don't have the bile to help you collect and, and retrieve those fat soluble nutrients from the GI tract. So, mm. uh, uh, you know, if you don't have a functioning pancreas, that's another issue. I mean, you could always take a supplement that contains pancreatic enzymes. Lipase would be the key one, the, the, the one that helps you uh, structure and absorb the fats in the diet. When I say structure, structure it in a way where it's absorbable. Hmm. Okay. A really good Thanks. tip about the MCT oil. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of people losing their gallbladders. For, you know, I mean, there's an association of animal fats, not not fish oil, but but most animal fats, uh, heavy animal fat diet and gallstones. And if you have the gallbladder clogged and the ducts in the gallbladder clogged, they tend to remove it rather than having you change the diet. So, you know, people on plant-based diets tend not to get the gallbladder issues that make them want to remove them. I mean, the, you know, they're, they're the appendix, the tonsils, they used to remove them without any regard for what they did. The tonsils are part of the immune system. The appendix is part of the immune system. I've got dictionaries going back to the 1960s that say the, the appendix has no known function. And about 20 years ago, they figured out it was part of the immune system. It, is, it has evolved in animals at least 150 times in dozens of species. And it's a fold or, or a pouch in the intestine that's rich in lymph tissue that is used for, uh, it's actually like a boot camp to mature uh, immune cells using probiotics. The probiotics interface with the immune cells. And that's where they do it. Mm -hmm. So you can live without an appendix, but you're losing that function. You can, you know, you yeah, can lose you a can spleen, spleen and, and live, but you're losing a function in the immune yeah. system. Yeah, and that's definitely a big one too, that people, uh, that, and uh, like you mentioned, the appendix, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not a vestigial organ with no known function. They figured, they finally figured it out in this century. Yes. Look at us go. <laughs> yep. Um, so can you get vitamin D from mushrooms? You can get vitamin D from mushrooms. I have seen packages of mushrooms in the grocery store that actually have a vitamin D claim because they're growing them under UV lights. The fruiting body, the mushroom part, is if they grow it under UV lights, it will produce vitamin D too. That's neato. And there's nothing wrong with vitamin D too. It's just a plant sterols converting into vitamin D instead of animal sterols converting into vitamin D 
They are extremely similar and the body treats them virtually the same. Now there is a bias for D3 because that's the form that is naturally made in our bodies. But that doesn't mean the other form isn't a good substitute. Exactly. I'll, uh, are you saying uh, all mushrooms? Uh, all mushrooms that are exposed to ultraviolet B rays of light. It needs a full spectrum light. You know, if, if they're grown in hothouses and they don't have enough light, you know, they just have normal fluorescent lights or something, they're not going to make much vitamin D. Huh. I had a, I had, oh, sorry. I, I was just thinking, well, you know, typically we buy the criminy mushrooms or the shiitake mushrooms and those kinds of mushrooms. Are those kinds of mushrooms the ones you're talking about that have vitamin D? Yeah, I've actually seen regular white mushrooms in a grocery store that have a label claiming vitamin D content because they've been grown under special lights. Okay, so if they're not grown under special lights, they don't have vitamin D. Or they might have very little. Yeah. Okay. And okay. someone asked about the heroic doses where the D2, D3 difference becomes apparent. Uh, the doctors are typically using pills with 50,000 units or more. So it's it's probably ten times or more what we what you would take on a daily basis. Oh boy, yeah. <laughs> well, look at it yeah. this way: a doctor gives you fifty thousand units and tells you to take one a week. Well, what's fifty divided by seven? A little over seven thousand. That's true. So about seven thousand a day is about the same as fifty thousand a week. But you're but not you're getting not it all at it once. At once. So there's a difference in how the body handles it. It's not getting a surplus. Definitely. Yeah, I, uh, I um, didn't follow directions. So I um, <laughs> want to kind of share this uh, just for those of you. Um, uh, make sure to keep track of how much vitamin D that you're also doing. Um, that you don't go overboard like I did one winter and gave myself kidney stones. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, well, here's the other thing. Vitamin D helps you absorb calcium. But where does the calcium go? You need to pair it with vitamin K and specifically vitamin K2. It, and that's it, where I went wrong. <laughs> yes. The, the higher the dose of vitamin D you take, the more likely you need vitamin K because you can accumulate the vitamin D, but you don't want it accumulating in the bloodstream or, or the feet or someplace else when you can transport it into cells and tissues, make bone, clean out arteries of calcium, those kind of things uh, to go where they're appropriately supposed to go instead of waiting for something that's not there, a nutrient that's missing. Um, does, a does now have a, uh, formula blend that actually has both of those? Are we do. And we make different strengths. Uh, one of them was one of my formulas, which is the, uh, uh, 5,000 D3 and the 180 microgram of vitamin K2 as MK7, which is the one that absorbs the best and lasts the longest. And, uh, you know, that's, I, I mean, but I take the 5,000 D, but I also take, I take 600 MK7 vitamin K2 a day because I'm old and I want to make my, sure my arteries are clear of calcium and stuff like that. So I'm taking a quadruple dose. You know, there's no safety issue. There's no upper limit on vitamin K. So, and vitamin K2 is less likely to cause clotting than K1. K1 is really the form that causes clotting, not K2. And, uh, you know, so it's, uh, you know, not, I don't have to worry about, because I'm not taking uh, Coumadin or one of those kind of blood thinners that are going to interact with vitamin K either. And if you're taking those, the issue is you can't vary your vitamin K intake dramatically from day to day. You can't have a giant salad one day and nothing the next day. You can't take 300 micrograms of vitamin K one day and nothing the next day. Uh, you take, you, you need to get the RDA at least, 
And so you, you can't avoid vitamin K, even if you're on the medications, but you don't want to vary the levels dr dramatically from day to day if you're on certain medications like Coumadin. The That's newer okay. ones like Xarelto don't, don't interact with vitamin K and don't, it doesn't matter. It'll say on the medication. That's a really good point to bring up. Yeah, we definitely don't want any kind of um, side effects or adverse effects that might um, counter um, contradict what the medication is trying to do. And um, yeah, uh, the um, so with with the um, supplementation of the vitamin D with the K two, you're supporting, you know, also bone health too, in a sense. And, um, you know, uh, like how it was mentioned in your presentation, preventing falling, um, which is a, a huge thing with um, the um, elderly um, demographics. Um, I'm in school right now for kinesiology and um, learning about the that weight bearing um, exercises. And then you had also mentioned um, that in, in your presentation as well, yeah, in yeah. conjunction with that supplementation. So really important. Yeah, I mean, vitamin D is a, an important nutrient. It's an essential nutrient. Uh, it's not too well understood because you know, there, there's different forms of it and the, the dosing works differently at different levels. And uh, it works on many more things than we've been told throughout the years. You know, the, the, the U.S. government believes in bone and dental health and really has not acknowledged the other benefits that even the European Food Safety Agency has recognized. You know, so that I mean, that that's interesting that there are acknowledged benefits in medical journals and in foreign governments, even very conservative ones, that the U.S. government has not yet recognized. And I think one reason is because when the Institute of Medicine, uh, the Food and Nutrition Board, uh, they are looking at setting the RDAs and, and uh, those kind of things. They, they, they don't put any experts on vitamin D on the yeah, vitamin D panel. They just, they put, just the, put their favorite, their favorite doctors, doctors on there who aren't experts. Yep. And so they're looking at also being very conservative. What, are, what do we already have? We don't want to vary too much from the past. So when the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition came out with a study in 2010 saying that the RDA should be raised from 400 to 2000. The Institute of Medicine raised it from 400 to 600. And when the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition reviewing all the medical literature said the upper limit should be 10,000, not 2000, the Food and Nutrition Board raised it from 2000 to 4000. They're incrementally raising it over decades instead of bringing it where it is appropriate based on the studies, because they want a huge margin of safety. So, which is, which is yeah, understandable, we, but, um, but yeah, it's like, might as well get the information out there to the public and, you know, do it safely and be like, everyone be safe about this. <laughs> yeah, so 10,000 is safe for just about everybody, but 4,000 is the upper limit they recommend. Just so you don't accidentally go overboard. <laughs> you know, but knowing what the studies say, I take 5,000 a day and there's some in my multi. I might be getting 6,000 a day. I'm not worried about that. And I want to have my serum levels checked. They're fine. I tend to have low, low, low vitamin D. And I have also had some serious reactions to too much vitamin D. I was prescribed 50,000 units a, a week in a, in a pill. You know, I take one 50,000 right. unit tablet. And after about three, three weeks, maybe a month, I broke out into a rash, which I didn't know what it was. And the only thing I could conclude was that it was the vitamin D because I stopped the vitamin D and the rash cleared. And that right. happened to me another time that I broke out into a rash 
and I realized that I was getting about, um, it was up on the limit of about 60,000 a week, but over it every day. And that was too much for me. I can't handle that. You might so, have had plenty to start with. Did they do, actually do a blood test before? Yeah, I, I'm low on vitamin D. I'm always okay. low. I don't absorb stuff well. I have, I have absorption problems. Um, so I'm, I'm also wondering medicine. if it might have been the, the capsule itself um, that the vitamin D was in. Could have well, I think two different two different types of vitamin D. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh dang. <laughs> yeah. And one's one's a drop, vitamin drop with K2, and the other's a tablet. So it's hard to know. Yeah. But, yeah. But if if it does yeah. that to you, it does it to you. There's no arguing with that. Yeah. You know. I don't know. You haven't heard of that before. Uh well, not at, Not that, at dosing. that dosing. That's normally That's considered normal. safe, but you know, maybe the the single high dose was more than you could tolerate. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Yeah. And maybe it set up a sensitivity for when I get into the high dose range again. Yeah, because the high I doses do work vitamin. differently. Yeah. Do you know if it was D2 or D3 they gave you? It was. I'm pretty sure it was D3. I usually take D3. Okay, because D three, like I said, you know, is is considered ten times as toxic. So uh, that's why they usually will give D two in the high doses. Okay. Fewer side effects. Okay, well that's good to know too. And they both absorb at that level at the same rate, so I get more. Maybe yeah. I get more vitamin D and be safer if I took the vitamin D two. D two might end up being safer, but you know what? You don't need to take 50,000 a week or whatever. You could do yeah. 5,000 a day and it's almost the same thing. Yeah, that's that's what I do about. And if you're tolerating that, you don't need to change what's working. Right. Right. And just so as long as it brings up my level. Yeah, because the body's, the body's not, not used to getting a huge dose. Used. I mean, that would be equivalent to falling asleep in the sun in Las Vegas or something in the summer. And you wake up and you... You have way too much vitamin D because that's a good point. Take so long, you you turn into a lobster. Yeah, that happened to me once. It took <laughs> half an hour. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I understand. I've been burned a few times in my life yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, but that's a good point. I, I can't. It just can't take all that at once. Small doses every day are, are better for me. Well, do, do you know why and how the skin tans in response to the sun? It's it's actually the an amino acid tyrosine is oxidizing due to exposure to sunlight and, and it oxidizes the melanin. I'll get paid the doctor. And What's I'll let that? you know what they said. She's in a trauma case, so that's why it's taking her so long, but she is going to make her way up tonight. Okay, but she told me to tell you. Um, I think she's talking with someone. In general, they want to make sure that you're tolerating. I'm going to uh, going to mute that for just a moment. Okay. Um, <laughs> going to put in the chat boxes here on uh, Facebook and here on Zoom. Just wanted to share the the website info, and I did find that that um, D3 and K2 uh, formula, they're on the website. Um, lots of great articles too, and um, more info if you're interested, folks. Yeah, I'll mention one more thing. If you get vitamin D in gummies or something, the gummies are typically made by candy companies, not supplement companies. And in, in tests, independent tests, the, the dosing is all over the board on those kind of forms. Uh, vitamin D is used, you know, you know, 15 micrograms is something is like 15 millionths of a gram. So it's very, very tiny dosing. So, you know, candy companies are not used to being that precise. And when you start getting into the gummies and some of these other forms like that, you end up with uh, hard to control 
dosages and all all supplements, but especially the very low dose low ones dose like, ones vitamin, like D. vitamin D. So uh, you know that is an issue. Um, some independent studies have shown a wide range of vitamin D levels in many products, not just gummies, because companies are not using the sophisticated equipment needed to accurately measure vitamin D at low levels. In other words, a high performance liquid chromatography with a mass spectrometer, which is a routine thing we would do at a company like ours, but uh, smaller companies might use just the HPLC and, and be much less accurate in their measurements by not using the higher end instrumentation. So, you know, there's a lot of variables like that that affect uh, these products and, you know, things like vitamin D, you know, you can end up with too much or too little by getting the wrong brand that's not measuring accurately. So you know, if, if you are the kind of person that would contact a company and ask how they test and, and you find out it's done by HPLC with MS, mass spectrometer, you know you're getting something that's gonna be more accurate. And um, Just like with everything, um, that now does. Um, it's high quality, um, re reassured and um, uh, tested. Um, they they uh, wouldn't put anything out there to the public that they don't um, completely um, um, feel um, that it is the and know that it is the best highest quality possible out there. Well, thanks, no, thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, anytime I take a now product, um, it is always a, a, a really good experience. Um, there, um, you can you can just tell that there there's a lot a lot of love um, put into the formulation and. Um, there's um, just so many um, great options of um, supplements and other products too, like the um, essential oils that y'all um, create as well. Well, thanks. Yeah, we're actually the largest family-owned business in the natural products industry. And <laughs> what's interesting about that is that we're not as worried about quarterly profits and we don't have outside investors and venture capitalists and pharmaceutical companies telling us what to do. We actually can do things like invest in testing, invest in the facilities, invest in, in better quality and take a lower margin at the to boot. We're a value brand. We believe in having the best quality for the most possible price. So that you can afford your health without skimping on quality. And being family owned gives us the tools we need to do that. We're a debt-free company. We own our own buildings. Uh, the family is investing constantly into the labs and the people. We've got 160 people working in our quality control department in our labs. I mean, that's bigger than most vitamin companies. Total people, and it's maybe 10% of our staff working in that area. So, you know, we are, we actually publish study, studies how to test things and develop the methods used by industries. And some of you might have seen online that we've done testing of no name brands on Amazon and we've and exposed that they were not using good standards. They didn't meet their label claims. And Amazon has actually increased their requirements for supplement companies as a result of our testing. Yay! So we want everyone to have good products, whether they're our products or not. We actually share our methods with industry. We don't license them. We sh freely share the methods we have published, how to test products uh, and ingredients, including how to test for pharmaceuticals and raw materials. So you know, these are things that are used by industry that we developed at our own expense because we believe in sharing. And you know, if, if supplements get a bad rap in the media, we're all gonna be suffer, even the good companies. 
So we would prefer to share and collaborate with our competitors rather than uh, try to one up them. I, I'm actually very good friends with uh, people at other vitamin companies. And I used to be a retail manager for many years. And uh, I'm, I know a lot of these people for a long time and we're still very good friends. Uh, some of the educators from other companies like Irwin Naturals or, or CV Sciences, I'm, I'm very good friends with. That's what's so great. Um, and now all of you know um, <laughs> um, how amazing now is and um, that um, they know that it's all about the community and that it takes a village and, um, you know, uh, they support your health and you as a consumer. And that's what it's all about. And that's why we support companies like Marlene's because, you know, these independent companies are hard to find nowadays. So much is corporate, so much is internet driven. And, you know, I, I have been in their stores a number of times, talked to the people. I actually did a staff training this morning uh, for Marlene's. And, uh, you know, they, they're great people and they really care about their products and their customers. So, yeah, it, it's hard to find that, you know, the marketplace is so impersonal nowadays to find people who really care, you know, Elizabeth and her team. Thank you so much, Neil. Yeah, we're, we're all so grateful for all of you who've been able to tune in with us tonight. We wouldn't be able to put on these wonderful educational lectures without you and um, your, um, uh, your thirst for knowledge. And so we thank you. Thanks for taking time out of your busy afternoon to spend with us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, everybody. And um, check out um, our website for our July classes. I uh, just put them up on the website. But um, thank you, Neil, so much for um, your expertise. Every time I always get so inspired and go down a rabbit hole of, um, a, you know, different thoughts and information that, um, that sparks from your presentation. So thank you. Thanks, Alice. I mean, Elizabeth. <laughs> rabbit hole. Rabbit hole. <laughs> Well, All thank right. you, everyone. Oh, we're going to say goodbye to our Facebook Live friends.